All right, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Thank you very much for attending our webinar this month for Linux Foundation Public Health. Uh, very excited to be able to um, um, introduce and highlight the work done at the Ontario Brain Institute. Um, one of the exciting aspects of working with Linux Foundation Public Health has been our coordination with stakeholders and uh, other participants in the industry, public health agencies, WHO. We've obviously featured WHO here before, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, um, Institute for Exceptional Care, uh, and it's a thrill to be able to present uh, um, OBI and their work around brain research, which in their pursuit of open science, open data, and, and other um, um, new avenues for neurological research I believe lays the groundwork for a lot of potential open source and open science projects that we could ultimately collaborate on. So with that, uh, uh, without any further ado, I will turn it over to the uh, standing team from Ontario Brain Institute to present themselves and uh, and walk through their work. Take it away. Thanks everyone, good morning. Okay, thanks Jim and yeah, good morning everybody. So to start off with the Ontario Brain Institute, we are a provincially funded not-for-profit organization based in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, with the mission to make Ontario a world's leader in neuroscience research, commercialization, and patient care. So in the collaborative research arm of things, we're an active partner in the funding, fielding, and dissemination of research. We also have supported and developed a state-of-the-art informatics platform that offers support to our programs in the storage management and analysis of research data and we'll talk more about this platform called Brain Code during today's webinar. But in addition to our collaborative research focus at the OBI, we also support things like commercial innovation. We help both research and industry partners coordinate commercial, commercialization opportunities uh, through the application of brain related technologies and we have different programs for example the entrepreneurs and uh, nerd programs run by the organization, run by the organization to help de-risk investment in these neurotechnology projects. The final arm of OBI is related to connected care, where we strongly work with um, different patient and community representatives to ensure that their voice is being heard within our research programs to both inform the uh, planned research of those networks, but also in the dissemination and interpretation of the findings from analysis. So that's a very brief overview of what OBI is as an organization. And I guess we should also introduce who we are as well. We kind of jumped ahead of ourselves. So I'm Brendan Bean. I'm the manager for informatics here at OBI. And in my role, I oversee the applications and development of our brain code platform. And Hina, over to you. Hi, everyone. I'm Hina Chima. Um, I'm the program lead for informatics operations with the brain code team at OBI. Um, so I work a lot in the operation side of things and supporting our users in the use of our platform. Um, so with that, we'll jump into a bit about what brain code is. Um, so BrainCode is a large scale neuroinformatics platform developed and managed by OBI. Um, the six integrated discovery programs that OBI funds and manages collect data and contribute it to this platform. Um, so it does allow for the storage management um, and analysis of different types of data that's collected by researchers across the province, uh, whether that be imaging, uh, genetics or clinical. Um, and because of this, it's kind of described as a shared brain for researchers in Ontario and beyond. So on this slide here, you'll see listed the six integrated discovery programs. Um, Andre is our program that focuses on neurodegenerative diseases, a pond on neurodevelopmental disorders, CPNet on cerebral palsy, handbind on depression, connect on concussion, and Eplink on epilepsy. Um, so you'll notice that the programs range from looking at childhood diseases to the diseases of aging. Um, and again, all of these programs are collecting and contributing different types of data to our platform. So data really is at the center of what we do. Um, the programs here are represented by purple bars and they collect similar data modalities, which are represented by the blue bars on this slide um, in a standardized manner on brain code. Um, so that allows for consistency in data collection across studies, uh, better data quality, um, and more opportunities for data sharing and cross-study analysis. Um, our theory of change is that if we work together on common issues, we can achieve impact faster than if we work alone. Um, so we do this through a model of contract research or, with research, um, and that includes hospitals and institutions across the province. Um, we also have an extensive brain code network where we support over a thousand users from our programs across numerous sites. Um, and our services to these programs include data standardization, uh, so making sure data is collected in the same manner across different sites, 
uh, data federation. Uh, so supporting it uploaded different types of data to the platform. Again, things like imaging, uh, clinical, genomics. Uh, we also offer data linking. So being able to link to external databases such as the Institute for Clinical and Evaluative Sciences in an effort to leverage data that already exists and advance discoveries. Um, and finally, data analysis. So supporting your users in analyzing their data through the tools and workspaces that we offer. And as I mentioned earlier with Brain Code, we strive for standardization um, so that we can better compare data and have more opportunities for data sharing. Um, so this is only possible if data is in the same format and we're really able to compare apples and apples. Um, and for that reason, OBI had established the common data elements um, that help define and format the different types of research variables. Um, so you'll see those listed on the left side of the slide here. And then we also do standardization across scanners uh, through checking for signal quality. Um, and finally, a bit about governance. Um, so OBI is a not-for-profit organization and not a researcher. Um, so we have multi-site REB approval and participation agreements with institutions like hospitals and universities. Um, and these participation agreements specify data elements that are to be uploaded to the platform um, in order for that data to flow onto brain code. Um, and essentially a participation agreement is akin to a data transfer agreement. And one of our fundamental principles of the platform is that we operate based on informed consent. Uh, so that ensures clarity for study participants and we've developed standard informed consent language um, that really informs them on how sensitive data will be collected, entered, de-identified, and shared uh, using brain code. Um, and on our end, we also review REB approval letters and consent forms and track them to ensure compliance. Okay, thanks again. So when it comes to sharing data on brain code, we have three zones for data sharing called zones one, two, and three. So within zone one, that's where our research networks upload data initially. So if you can imagine, for example, our depression program, and find as you know, mentioned in one of the opening slides, they say they're, say they're running a study at multiple different sites in the province of Ontario. We've made sure that they're collecting the same standardized consent form language for their studies, that they're collecting the same standardized data elements, and also that they also have organized various data transfer agreements to like upload to green code in the first place. So zone one is where those investigators can share data amongst themselves in those networks for primary analysis. And those data sets can contain directly identifying information um, if the relevant ethics board approvals allow for it. So that's how zone one operates. It's for the networks themselves to do that initial analysis. Now, once those initial findings have been published, we work with the programs on mapping out which data sets we're gonna make available to external users for secondary use. So in that zone one to zone two transfer, we're now taking curated data packages and preparing it to make that preparing to make them available for secondary use. And in that transfer from zone one to zone two, we undertake several um, de-identification processes. So for example, we make sure that certain dates like full date of birth, full date of death are not contained in the data packages. Similarly, for MRI scans for the high high um, resolution anatomical images, we make sure there are no facial features in those um, MRI scans for secondary use. Now, once those data sets are in zone two, that's where external groups can request access um, for secondary purposes. So we have a data access committee who reviews proposals that come in. We do request ethics approval or waiver is obtained by the external groups. And depending on the decisions marked from the data access committee and also our internal executive committee, we can either approve or reject the request for secondary use. If approved, that's where the data goes go to zone three and the requester can either analyze the data sets on a workspace environment we can offer to them, or they can download locally via a legally binding data transfer agreement with the respective um, legal contracts office. So that's how, that's how data sharing happens um, on brain code across the three, zo three zones. And on the next slide, um, is an example of how we announced these various zone three data releases. So just last week, our school policy program released data sets from their Hemi-Nest database, which focused on children and youth aged two to 18 with a confirmed diagnosis of hemiplegic and cerebral palsy. And in this data set, we have things like clinical assessments, um, molecular assay results, as well as um, MRI scan results, images, et cetera. So this is our sixth um, controlled release, we call them, so far on, so far on 
Greenfield platform. And we are releasing these rich multimodal data sets for secondary use to both academic investigators, but also not for profits, even commercial groups who want to say, train or test an algorithm using these various data sets. So just a recent release in the past week highlighted on this slide. So as I mentioned, we do a lot of work on data collection, supporting data curation analysis, data releases, but also we have a focus on data linkages with other databases and through green code. And one prime example here is how we link with health and administrative databases in the province of Ontario. So for those in the call who might not be aware, in this province, um, the majority of residents have access to our publicly funded healthcare system and are assigned what's called an OHIP number, an Ontario health insurance plan number. So when you go see your family doctor, you go to a clinic, you're availing of the services, and your OHIP number is being used or trapped in those circumstances. And there are groups like the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences, or ICS, who collect such health and MIM data for analysis purposes. Now on brain code through a consent from language methods approval, we can actually uh, collect an encrypted version of the participant's um, OHIP number, and we will stand use that encryption technology with our partners at ICS, and in this way, link the research data on our systems with the respective health and MIN data at groups like ICS. So in that way, we're actually combining both the clinical realm of things with the research data being collected from our network's perspectives. And altogether, we've now linked just over, I think, 10,000 participants through, the, through this model, um, and we have completed roughly three to four um, projects in this area on the analysis side. So it is a really innovative item on the platform that we're able to link with such external databases um, like this. And just to note, you know, when it comes to the actual technical operations of brain code, we do work very closely with an external partner. Um, the consortium is called INDOC, and there are three main members. INDOC research helps primarily on the day-to-day data, -day database management with a focus on clinical and molecular data management. Our colleagues at Baycrest here in Toronto help us on more the imaging side, functional time series data management. And finally, the current data sets are housed at what's called the Center for Advanced Computing, or the CAC. Um, this is a high performance computing center based at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. So those are the three major technical partners that help us on the overall operations and development of the Greenfield platform. So I think this is our final slide, and it's kind of just to highlight um, the various partnerships we're involved with on the neuroscience um, stage. So starting with the top left, the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, or GA4GH, and um, this is an international body focused on developing policies around responsible sharing of genomics and healthcare data. And there are various different um, projects or driver projects, they call them, um, you know, look, looking at different areas um, related to that topic. And we're involved primarily on the research ethics working group, as well as another working group looking at standardizing data access committee um, functions across various sectors. So that's one example of how we're working with other international groups in this area. Secondly, um, to the right of that is INCF. This is the International Neuroinformatics Coordinating Facility based out of Sweden. And this group is helping set standards in the neuroscience space. I work closely with them on trying to see how we can um, roll out or test some of the standards that that group um, supports. Below those two is the Canadian Open Neuroscience Platform, or CRNP. This is a project which has been trying to build a planned Canadian platform for the sharing of neuroscience data. And we've, we've been involved on both the technical committees and ethics committees for several years. And through the Canadian Open Neuroscience Platform, we have made information available about our data releases and made, made, made such information available to other people who might be interested in requesting access to these data sets. So another important partner on the national side of things. And then finally, to the right there is another national group we're involved with here in Canada called the Autism Sharing Initiative, or ASI, which has brought together various partners who have pre-existing databases or data sets focused on autism spectrum disorder. And we're trying to, you know, with partners in this consortium, build out processes to allow for the combining of data between these various databases to increase end number, to allow for more, for more integrative analysis between these various partners. So again, just another example of how we're involved in both these national and international initiatives to excel neuroscience data sharing and analysis. So I believe that was our final slide. And we think, you know, we've talked a lot about brain code, so it might be good to also demo the platform. So Hina, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Brennan. Um, so as Brennan mentioned, we'll jump into some demos of the brain code platform. Um, just going to share my screen here. 
Um, so what you see here is the Brain Code website. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, we've gone live with uh, multiple data releases over the past year. Um, and you'll see all of those listed on our data release landing page. Um, so just scrolling down. Yeah, there's been a few. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so we'll show here um, the CPNet data release that Brennan mentioned earlier, um, and you'll see here that there is a description about the data release itself, as, as well as the CPNet program. Um, if you navigate to learn more, you'll see there's additional resources to click around in and get more information about CPNet, the work that they do, um, along with the data that's available. If you actually go into the Get Access button, You'll be navigated to this page um, that better outlines uh, the process that you would have to take in order to get access to the data. Um, so you'll see that you sign up for a brain code account, you sign our platform terms of use agreement, and then you're able to explore in this dashboard um, essentially the data and look into the metadata um, and then actually select your data through a dashboard. Um, once you've done that, you'll submit an application for data access, um, which also requires REB approval, and that'll go through two data two uh, reviews, um, one with our data access committee and one with our steering committee. Um, and once that's been approved, you'll be set up with a workspace um, where, you're able, where you're able to complete your data analysis. So just clicking through here, you'll have access to things like the study protocol to look at, uh, data collection instruments. So you're able to open up these files um, and same with data quality standards. Um, and then finally, you'll see here this study dashboard. Uh, so this is an interactive dashboard where you're actually able to see the data that we have available and you can filter um, uh, based on what you're looking for. So you'll see here as I make different selections, the dashboard's updating. Um, and once you're happy with what you've selected, you're able to proceed to review what you've selected and then actually submit your request for that data. And then you're sent an email with our data access request form. So again, this is for our CPNET data release. Um, and then just navigating back, Earlier this year, we also released data from our uh, neurodegenerative disease program uh, called Andri. Uh, so this was data from their foundational study um, and it's tabular baseline data. Again, there's some um, information here about the program and the data release. Uh, if you go to learn more, you'll, you'll be able to see further resources to learn more about Andri um, and the data. And then if you again, navigate to get access, You'll see a similar landing page, as I showed earlier, um, outlining the steps in terms of accessing the data. And again, um, the related study uh, metadata. So if you go into study design, um, you're able to kind of access these resources. Um, again, same for data quality standards, conventions and contributors. And then um, finally, you end up at data package selection. Again, this is another interactive dashboard where you're able to filter by cohort and by data platform. Um, so again, the dashboard will update as I make my selections. Um, and then from here, you can do multi-select depending on what you're looking for um, and add that in here. And then um, again, you would proceed to review what you've selected and then submit your request. So again, just navigating back to our data release uh, planning page, you'll see um, all of our data releases listed here um, in a similar manner where you can learn more about the release and then get access to that dashboard to make the actual request. So with that, we also have um, more internal uh, dashboards that are used by our programs for study monitoring and tracking. I'll show here an example for our Andre program. So as you can see, again, this is an interactive dashboard where you're able to filter by different cohorts um, and by different sites, depending on what information that you're looking for. Um, you're able to see things like um, enrollment, uh, withdrawal, and uh, completion status, depending on uh, the different visits. Um, and this is really helpful for the programs in terms of monitoring their studies. Um, and we work with the programs on kind of customizing these uh, based on what their needs are. Uh, Brennan, anything else you wanted to add? Right. Yeah, I think that's a good demo, you know, the various dashboards we offer. So as you can see, we develop dashboards both for data monitoring purposes within the, um, if you remember back to the slide, the zone one. So the programs in zone one can use dashboards to track recruitment targets, withdrawal of participants via these, um, via, via brain code. And for the data release dashboards, I want to bring up maybe Signet again, yeah. because there's kind of, um, there is thinking behind why it's arranged this way. So at this level, we want to make sure that the external user accesses the information first, like the protocol, data dictionary, data quality standards to help inform them 
what exact data cuts they need to help answer their research questions. So again, we're trying to make sure that the user has sufficient information to make an informed decision around the data cut on the respective um, data release dashboard. And as Hina mentioned, once the cut is made, they get sent a survey to the email to complete the rest of the process, which involves in uploading the proposal, uploading a copy of the ethics approval, uploading a copy of the resume, et cetera. And that goes to our committees for review and approval as needed. But um, again, we kind of have taken this approach to make sure the user is informed about the data sets they're planning to request access to. But overall, then I think that's it. You know, would any other dashboards you want to show in the Kanban program? Um, I'm happy to show maybe the Kanban program as well. That was another data release that we went live with earlier this year. So I'm just scrolling down here. Again, you'll see the description um, about the Kanban program. Similar format, if you click on learn more, there's additional resources and further information. Um, again, for you to explore before you um, actually get into making the data request. Um, again, if you navigate to get access, um, you end up on the same landing page. Um, and again, you have access to things like the study protocol, um, along with data collection instruments, data quality standards. And then finally, again, there is a study dashboard, which is interactive. Um, and you're able to kind of select um, which packages you're interested in. And once you're happy with your selection, again, you would uh, review and submit uh, for access. Yeah, exactly. And so I think that's the current status of our data release so far. We are working with um, our various research programs and up on other upcoming releases. So there will be at least one more release for this calendar year. And we're already planning for further releases in 2023. So stay tuned on that front for an expansion of our data release um, repertoire. <laughs> we want to have a better one. Um, and I think that's it then from our side, Jim. Um, happy to take any questions. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Great presentation. And I personally am excited about that relationship between precision medicine, biomarkers, neurological health, and, and behavioral health. And of course, you know, how this helps kind of sort out what might be neurological, neurophysical, or, or neurobiological versus, you know, other behavioral health conditions where I think things still get mixed up. And this sort of precision medicine, I think, is a great advantage. Just to be clear, and I may have missed this part, but even though you're based in Ontario, this is open research that's available for, for anyone to be able to assist you with, right? Yeah, no, no, exactly. Yes. So we've had requests coming in from both European partners, American partners, both academics, not for profits, as well as um, early stage neurotech startups. So, yes, open to anybody outside of Canada. Um, it's still the same access process. We need a copy of the proposal, an ethics approval, et cetera. But no, it's not limited to Canada. And we have had data sharing arrangements with European sites and with American sites. Great. And, and besides the open science, open data aspect to it, obviously, the, the, the three of us have talked a bit about open source software and where you might see a, a fit for that going forward. Could you spend a couple minutes on that as well? Oh, sure. Sounds good. So, I mean, Brinko itself, when you look at the actual data capture tools, um, we try for the most part to use um, either open source tools or tools where we can get a license. Mm -hmm. So, for example, all of our data capture tools. Um, I'll kind of listen quickly. We use a tool called RedCap for clinical data capture, a tool called XNF for imaging data capture, and another tool called LabKey for molecular data management. We tend to kind of use the either open source model or the versions we can access as a profit. So um, in that way, we're able to really um, build a platform that is sort of based on open source models as much as possible. Um, with the code we've developed in Green Code, we have been exploring ways to make it available to other partners in in the open source space. Um, stay tuned on that, we're still having some discussions. But away from the actual brain code infrastructure, we have earlier this year um, finished a project whereby we developed a tools catalog um, on our OBI GitHub account, listing all the various tools our networks use for their data collection, data curation, data analysis needs. And perhaps, Jim, you can share a link to that GitHub after this, um, this presentation with the folks on the call. But that GitHub that GitHub page actually lists a lot of the different um, tools that our program uses for various modalities. I think, you know, we cover clinical, MRI scans, EG, a whole range of different data elements on the GitHub page. So we can share that as well. 
Excellent. That would be great. More than happy to pass along whatever you share. Uh, one question from Seth in the audience. He, he uh, wanted to know if you could expand a bit more on how the data workspaces work. Oh, sure. No problem. So right now, when it comes to workspaces, we tend to bring up virtual machines, um, either Windows operating system or Linux operating system. We offer a particular set of cores and storage. Um, that tends to meet most needs of the research groups coming in so far. Although, however, given our current capacity, we can't offer things like GPU access. So in those cases, we can allow for local download with a legally, um, you know, legally binding data transfer agreement. So right now, our workspace offerings tend to be virtual machines um, for the various groups. We do offer a download if we can't meet the workspace requirements of that, um, of that group. As I mentioned right now, we are primarily based in an academic high performance computing center. Um, we have been exploring cloud options for the future of green code and the various cloud vendors and the various um, analysis environments they could offer to our users in the next phase. But um, again, that's kind of all under discussion and planning right now. But um, it, is, it is something we're considering. But as of right now, that's our current workspace offering. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, that was great. And if there's any more questions on data workspaces, feel free to throw them into the chat or the Q&A. And uh, Seth, have you covered this as well? Or excuse me, uh, uh, I, I don't know if you covered this as well, but uh, kind of what your plans were going into next year, areas of expansion, development, um, you know, what, what's next on your horizon? That's a good question. Do you want to cover that? Sure. Uh, so as Brandon mentioned, uh, we're looking at potentially going live with two more data releases at the end, by the end of this year. Uh, so that would be for our epilepsy program called Eplink, um, as well as a follow up um, public data release um, for mouse imaging data. Um, and then next year, we're looking at actually building out our current data releases a bit more with follow up data uh, for both the Andre and Canbind uh, data releases. Um, so that's more so for next year. Yeah, exactly. And I guess tied to that as well. Um, so as an organization, uh, we will be starting a new funding phase, hopefully next year. And with that, there might be, um, we just, we are in the middle of an open call um, for research programs for the next funding phase. And with that, there might be some new uh, data protocols to uh, support collection with on the platform. Um, so that's something to consider for next year as well. Like new programs, starting data collection potentially, what does that mean in terms of um, any new modalities to support, et cetera? Um, but as of right now, we focus focuses ongoing data releases to um, the wider research community and ongoing data linkages that are helping with database partners here in the province of Ontario. And as I mentioned earlier, we are just looking at maybe potential cloud options for the next phase, but there's still a lot of development and discussion going on there, Joe. <laughs> Excellent. Um, how long does a typical data request take? Excellent question. Okay, so how it works is the request comes into us. We usually try and review all the material supplies within one week of the submission. We then, and then if all the materials look good, uh, we'll prepare for we'll, we'll prepare the request to be sent out to the data access committee for review. Um, we ask our committee members to complete the review within five working days, um, and you know, usually they're pretty good. <laughs> it's done within, done within that time, and following that, we then. Um, Bring the proposal to our executive mm -hmm. for review, and that's going to be as well. So that's the current timeline so far. Um, and then, depending on the request, we sometimes might have to do that data transfer agreement for local downloads, which can take, depending on the legal contracts office, weeks to months. Um, but in terms of the request coming in, we try to get feedback or approvals done within a couple of weeks. Um, but sometimes at the, at the beginning, though, maybe some back and forth just to check on ethics approvals, um, ensuring that the data cut they've made corresponds with their plan to use. So overall, Jim, I'd say within like a couple of weeks, that's, that's the going rate. But when it comes to data transfer agreements, it can take a bit longer. We'll call it three to four. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you for that follow up. Uh, if there's any other questions that uh, we'd like to hear from the OBI team. Okay, not seeing much else here. Again, I want to thank you for your participation today. Thanks very much to OBI for their participation. And as you can see, I think there's lots of threads that we look forward to working with in the future. Uh, and exploring these areas of open science and open data with open source software development, 
Uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact us directly or reach out in the Slack. Uh, and this presentation will be made on, available on the website as well. Uh, I'm sorry, we have one more question popping in late. That's fantastic. Um, are the downloads free and how is the compute paid for? You guys want to take that. Yeah, um, so right now it's, it's free. We don't charge any fee for access. Um, downloads are free. And right now, computes, we absorb the costs in our um, computing budget for now. Um, again, this is how things are currently based on the current release model. Um, depending on how the future looks, we, we might have to revisit that. But, uh, but currently, right now, there are no fees for access and there are no fees for computes. We just provide it as part of our general support to the research community. Excellent. Um, Sounds good. Yeah. One last canvas for questions. We don't want to leave anybody out or if there's anything as a follow-up that we might have necessarily thought of. Great, again, thanks very much to the OBI team. It's been a pleasure to, uh, to host your presentation today. Look forward to continued discussions. Thanks to everyone that was able to make the time here to attend and don't hesitate to let your colleagues know about it and the availability of the, the recording on the website. And look forward to talking to you next week uh, with our next webinar hosting the Department of Veterans Affairs and their VISTA cloud data project. Thank you from all of us at Linux Foundation Public Health and have a great rest of your day. Thank you Thank for you. having us. Bye for now.